All right, hello everyone. So there was a lot of questions about homework number six concerning the construction and use of the predictive parser. So I've tried to go through the whole problem and explain it as thoroughly as possible since this is one of the more complex problems you guys have been given this semester. Um, I hope you guys can follow along and I will be forward that there is two problems within it that I have not been able to rectify. You can still get all the way through to the full solution. I'm just not quite sure what's wrong with my solution. Uh, you'll see what they are as I go through and they'd be a good thing for you to bring up with Dr. Choi maybe to ask her and get a little clarification. So without further ado, um, I'm reading along the screen in front of me so I would recommend you have both the homework 6 assignment up, the one that says consider the following grammars G so on and so forth, and then also Dr. Choi's full notes, since I'll be referencing them, but won't be showing them in this video. So I'll be reading off those notes as well. Um, you should pause the video whenever you want to take a longer look. So, first off, homework six, we have grammar G, composed of the non-terminals, or as we like to call them, the variables, the terminals, the start terminal, and the production rules. So this is just everything that we've seen so far in the initial problem, the non-terminal symbols V, the terminal symbols T, and the start symbol S, which is prog, or program, and then our production rules for the problem. However, this is not a very useful way to do this assignment because we are going to have to write these terminals and non-terminals many times and as you might see one is in bold and one is not in the actual assignment but writing that effectively program PROG variable versus program terminal is going to be really confusing and uh, there's a lot of pretty lengthy terms so we're going to translate this into terminology that is a lot easier to work with and will reduce the amount of errors we might make in the process so the first step we're going to do is we're going to redefine all of our terminal signals sorry we're going to redefine all of our terminal symbols um, with the normal context-free grammar terminology we've been used to so program will be capital A1 ID list capital A2 and so on so forth so we'll have 11 terminal signals sorry we'll have 11 terminal symbols sorry We'll have 11 non-terminal symbols or variables. So those will all be A followed by an underscore of the number. This is going to be important because this numbering helps us remove left recursion as well. We need an order to do that. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to renumber or relabel our terminal symbols. So program lowercase a, id lowercase b, so on and so forth. So a through p. And then the last thing we're going to do don't worry about here on the left, that was just some earlier attempt that was not quite right. We're going to redefine our program rules, sorry, we're going to redefine our production rules in terms of our new sets of non-terminal symbols and terminal symbols. So for example, A1 goes to A, B, C, A2, D, E, A3, A4, F. I know the picture quality is a little fuzzy, but I think you guys are able to make out everything I'm writing. You'll be able to pause it and do these things that do take a while to write out by hand. Um, but I'll also be posting this when I post the final solutions, but this should give you a general idea and a good guide to go by. So once we've redefined everything, then we can start on problem one. So construct grammar G1 by removing all the left recursions from G. So a good place to start looking at this is go to Dr. Choi's notes and go to page 23 and on page 23 you will see the left factoring and removing left recursion section 2.82. Initially when I did this problem I tried to utilize the algorithm to eliminate both um, removing left, rec uh, left factoring and removing immediate left recursion. If you go to the bottom of page 23, you'll see in bold, removing immediate left recursions. That algorithm is much more extensive and 
can get you into a, I, I actually went through and did it all the way um, last year and I got some answers that were, um, that were really long and didn't seem to make much sense. So going about it in this simpler way where you are creating A primes, B, you're getting prime values of your initial production rules seems to work better. Um, so I'll try to show you. There's not a great example to follow. Um, if you look at the algorithm, you'll sort of see an example on pages 25, but that one also deals with removing um, non-immediate left recursion. Um, but a good one to look at is what's going on on page 27 for the first and follows. Below that you'll see a grammar written in terms of terminals and then terminal primes. So that's G4, E going to T, E prime. That's what we're going to try to create when we get rid of our left recursion. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. So, so we start with A1. So A1 is OK because it doesn't have any left recursion. It's calling other variables that are or other non-terminals. I'm going to use the term variables going forward just because it will help to get rid of ambiguity and I'll make, my, make fewer mistakes. Um, so A2 is further along, so is A3 and A4. A2, if you remember from our initial definition um, of the production rules, A2 goes to B or A2GB. So B is fine but A2 would be a recursion back on A2, and that is not what we want. So to deal with that, we're going to create a prime value and call it A2 prime, and we're going to put that at the end of all the strings that don't have any recursion, so in this case, just the B. So we're going to have A2 going to B A2 prime, and then we're also going to create a new A2 prime production rule going to what was following the recursion here, A2, GB, we're now going to stick the GB in front and put an A2 prime at the rear. So it's okay to have recursion within the prime values. The reason why it's alright is we're putting the primes on the right hand side, so when you think about a parse tree going out at each node left and right, you don't want a recursion on the far left because that would just keep creating left leaves over and over and over again. This on the right means that we'll always be partially moving forward in the recursion, and we'll also add these empty strings to allow for the kill states to get rid of the recursion. So A3 is troubling throughout the entire problem. Um, I had some issues creating the correct recursion function for it. So you can write this down. Uh, you can also write this one down, A3H going to A2I, A5E. So obviously we need to create some form of a recursion for the 3. Although the A2 is higher in priority, because we've already dealt with the A2 in terms of the A2 prime and the empty string, we can leave this as A2 and not try to create um, a non-immediate left recursion. When I was talking about that first algorithm with non-immediate left recursion, it actually creates redefined variables for every production rule that might have happened prior to this production rule. Um, it is very excessive and it wasn't necessary for this final parser to work, so we're not going to worry about it for now. Um, and it won't worry, you won't have to worry about it on the exam, this simpler way should work for the exam. But you can also ask Dr. Troy about this. So for A3, for now just take my word on it and um, go with H, A2, I, A5, E, A3. So all we're doing is moving the A3 to the back of the string instead of creating a whole new rule. And then we're also creating um, an empty string A3 at the back of the empty string as well. I think part of the reason why this works without modifying it is because it already has an empty string or statement, which means that it's able to kill itself when necessary. So this is a question I would have for Dr. Choi, and I would recommend you guys to talk to her about it in class um, to see if she can have any clarification. But continuing on, A5 is easy. We don't have any left recursion here. And you can see the only other ones we have left recursion on are A6. So A6 calls itself. So we do the same thing here, except now we have production, we have a variable instead of, we have a variable here, A7, instead of, a ter instead of a terminal. So all we do is stick the A6 prime behind the A7, which is what we're doing here, A7, A6 prime. Um, and then we create our A6 prime, which has E, A7, and then A6 prime, when we OR it with an empty string. So it's the same thing we were doing when we created the A2 prime, 
except we were dealing with a terminal instead of a variable. So we keep going along, and you'll keep seeing it's the same, no left recursions until we get to A10 again. And then A10, we have the similar thing. We have A10 here. A10 is recursing on itself. Um, so we're going to redefine A10 prime. We're going to make the initial A10 go to A11, which is what we had here, a non-recursive. Stick another A10 prime behind that, A11. And then in A11, we'll have O, A11, and then A10 prime at the rear, ORed with an empty string. And A11 is just a BRP. So now we've constructed a grammar. I know 3 is a little questionable. Um, don't worry about this 3. This one should work. The H, A2, I, A5, E, A3. Those are scratched out, sorry. Um, empty string or A3. And now that we have that, we can create our first and follow tables. So you might already be on it, um, but if we go to page 27 of Dr. Choi's notes, you'll see the explanation of how to construct first and follow. There's an algorithmic approach to doing both first and follow, but I found the best way to do it is actually to do your first table initially and then fill in your follows and then fill in additional follows. Um, but start by reading page 27 and trying to get a grips for the algorithm. So the first thing we would do, I might need another sheet of paper to do proper shielding for this, is we'd want to look at the first column of our first and follow. So here we have A1, and it's pretty easy to do the first. You just look at uh, the first rule in the first is if A is a terminal, first of A is an element of A. So here we're looking at our production rule, A1, the first thing that comes to is A. So that's a first of A. Um, then A2, similar, the first element we run into is B. Um, sorry, these are not the production rules we want to look at. These are the initial ones. We really want to look at, let me move this out of the way, our new production rules that have gotten rid of left recursion. So here they are. Um, so here are our new production rules. I know the A3 is a little out of the way. Let me uh, get this into a better view. So here's our A3. So here we are, A2, going to B because A2 goes to B first. Then A3, A3, uh, sorry, A2 prime. So A2 prime first is G and also empty string. So if there's an OR, you look at both sides of the OR, what happens first? For A3, H and empty string, H and empty string here, A5. Also, you'll notice on all of our production rules, I go 1, 2, th one, two, two prime, 3, 5, 4. This is simply because of the way Dr. Choi defined the problem. If you go back and look at it initially, when we defined our production rules, um, which I just put over here, she puts comp statements as A4 and type as A5, but when she refers to her production rules initially, uh, let's do this so you can still see what I'm talking about. Sorry, here you go. So com statements A4 is coming first, then type A5, but in the production rules, she writes type first, then comp statements. So this is the ordering, but this is the ordering of the definitions. So that's why you'll see throughout we talk about A5 before A4. So A5, J or K, the first of A5 or J or K, because both sides, J or K. Then A4, first comes L. I'm using capital L. That's the only capital I'm using for terminals to get rid of ambu ambiguity because lowercase l looks like an or. So we're going to use capital L for the terminal L. Everything else is lowercase for terminals. A6. Um, so A6, to see a first here, you actually have to read through our production rule. So A6, the first term, first character to appear is A7. So we need now, now we need to look at A7. See what its first is. Its first is A8. Then we look at A8. Its first is B. So the, B, the full first of A6 is B. A6 prime um, is E and also empty string. E and empty string. A7 
is uh, A7, A8, we do the same thing we did for A6, look at A8, um, and A8's first is B, so that's for that. A8 just goes straight to B, so that's first is B, A8's first is B. A9, B or P, because A9 goes to A10, A10 goes to A11, A11 is B or P, both are first because they're on different sides of the OR. A10 prime, first is, uh, did I skip one? No, A f A10 prime, first is O, or empty string. Um, or empty string, here you go. Uh, you're getting out of view of the camera, sorry. So, O, or empty string. And then A11 finally, B or P as well. So that's, um, that's how we do the firsts. And now we're going to start at the follow. So the follows algorithm is important to follow. And it's going to look a little similar to pumping lemma. Um, just another note, I, I'll be able to answer. Some people had some pumping lemma questions. I don't know if I'll have time to make a video about that, but I will answer them in my office hours. I think it's more important you focus on this because this content will be on your next exam where I don't think pumping lemma will be. So <clears throat> the uh, dollar sign we'll deal with later. Um, that's one of the rules in the first and follows. Um, that I'm not going to talk about it at the moment. Um, but if we break our initial production rule down, A1, ABC, A2, DE, A3, A4, F. And what we do is we break the string into the, th the four components of the first and follow algorithm. First is A, then a string of alpha, then B, then a string of beta. And how we calculate follows is we look at the B, and we look at what follows the B. So there's three conditions for the follow algorithm if you look on page 27 of Dr. Choi's notes. It says computing follow B. The first one is dollar sign is in follow S. So that's why we're sticking that here initially. So the first string always has a dollar sign follow. That has to do with the parser knowing when the end of the string is because it'll have a dollar sign there as well. So that just has to do with starting and completing. But the next one, if A goes to alpha, B, beta, then first of beta minus empty string is an element of follow B. So that's what we have here. D, terminal after A2, the first element of beta, is an element of follow A2. But there's th there are other cases we have to check within the first and follow. So now we shift alpha. So now alpha is including A, B, C, A2, um, D, E. B is resting on A3, and beta is resting on A4F. So now we look at B, A4. So this is a little different. Now we have a variable first after this variable. So that means we have to look at um, the second rule, which you'll see is... Um, Well, not exactly. Um, we look at the first of the, the variable. So we look at the first of A4. So in this case, we've already calculated that. We know the first of A4 is L. So we can write it as first of A4 is an element of fall of A3, but we can also just write this as L is an element of fall of A3. So that's what we have here, L. Um, we already have put D because we have D here. Um, sorry, I'm getting you guys mixed up. So even though we're doing the first, we're doing the follows for A1, they're calculating values for different positions in the follow table. So you're not going to do this linearly, A1, A2, A3. You're going to be jumping around um, and filling in the following the follow table as you analyze each production rule. And there'll be secondary parts of the follow table you'll have to fill in after you've filled in the first round because some follows are dependent on other follows. So sorry, what I meant to say was this D is an element of follow A2. So that means that D is going right here in the follow of A2. This 4, first of A4, which is an L, is going in the follow table of A3. So A3, if you go down, um, is going to be... Hold on. Um, wait a minute. Um, there should be something here that's, there might be a bit of a mistake. The point is though, this is, um, alright, discount that for a moment. 
I still think this is correct, but let's continue on. Um, A4 is an element of, so A4 here, which is a sub, which is a terminal of, so we've extended alpha now to go all the way through A3, and now B is looking at A4. F is following, is now an element of follow A4, which we have put, Oh, thank goodness. I was worried about that. Um, so really, um, this F should be here. I mixed up my A4 and my A5. That's Running them out of order can be a little tricky. Um, but let me just leave it for now, because the point is, you'll probably find some of the errors that I've made along the way, but the algorithm is still the same. But F here is an element of follow A4. A2, we do the same thing with A alpha B. So this case, where B, there's nothing following B, this is now, if you go back to Dr. Choi's notes, page 27, you'll see follow A2, is an element of follow A2 prime because this is the case where A goes to alpha B so that means that the follow of A is an element of the follow of B so that means the follow of A2 is the as an element of the follow of A2 prime because this is the A, this is the B, this is the third case in Dr. Choi's notes for computing follow, page 27. Um, so we won't be able to fill this part of the follow table until we found out everything that is in follow A2 um, so that's why I kind of do the follow table where I write elements on the left from the first run through and elements on the right after the second run through um, of the follows of the follows. So this is pretty monotonous and continues on for a while, but the point is you can continue this algorithm of analyzing the A alpha B, A alpha B for all of these, um, and you'll see what I did. You might be able to find a mistake I there might be one here, um, but for the sake of time, I want to get through this explanation. You can pause this and take a look. So this goes up to A7, A, B, beta, and then continuing on to A8. Um, whenever you get these just going to a terminal itself, you're not gaining any information. That's what these blank lines here mean. Um, and you can continue that all the way through A11. So, once we've constructed our first and follow table, we can move on to part C, which is constructing that predictive parser. So, for part C, we're going to want to keep this handy. This is now how we're going to use our first and follow to construct part C. So, I'll bring part C over, and I'll cover it up with part B. How about that? Um, and part C we're going to look at page 28 of Dr. Choi's notes. So this is using the first and follow. So we're really just going to be using, if you look at 3.8.4, constructing a predictive parser algorithm, predictive parser construction, input grammar G, output parsing table M. Um, for each A going to alpha, do steps 2 and 3. So I broke this down into steps 2 and 3. So <clears throat> step 2, um, we are going to look at each terminal A, um, and we're going to create an element in our predictive parser grid which part of the machine will create this production rule at element A1 at the terminal location A. So why we're writing this notation is eventually our goal is once we have all of our rules we'll be able to fill in a grid that explains the whole predictive parser as a lookup table that we can go into and then make calls from for the actual parsing production for the parsing part of the problem. And then when we fill in the grid, I'm just going to fill in with this key of A1, A2, so on and so forth, and something a little different for part three. Sorry, for step three. So we're in step two. So we keep doing this step two where we look at the production rule and we look at the first, and we're going to fill that part of the table in. So here, A2G. When you have multiple options like J and K, you're going to put it in twice. A5 at J and A5 at K. Um, so we're going to do that. 
for all of our rules, creating positions in our predictive parser table corresponding to the production rule and the first element. And if it's like in our previous problems where we have a first element that is a variable, we look at that variable and see what its first element is. So here, A7, B. Now we do part three of constructing a predictive parser. In part three, we're looking at all the empty string options. Now, I got rid of three, so once again, A3 is still problematic. It's the main source of why there might be a fundamental problem. Um, and once again, something I would recommend talking to Dr. Choi about. So A3 here, we still have as a possibility going to empty string. So if we look back at our initial production rules, you'll remember that once we got rid of left recursion, we only had four production rules that had an option as an empty, um, as an empty string. So here they are again. And they were A2 had an empty string option. A3, we're using this one. A6 prime and A10 prime. I meant A2 prime here, sorry. So we're going to do that. For, we're going to check those four out for part three. So for step three, we look at A21 going to empty string. And what the rule says is we look for um, if element if empty string is an element of first A, then A goes to alpha to M A B for each terminal B in follow of A. So this is where the follow table is important. So we're going to look at the follow table of A2 prime, which is right here, and that includes an I and a D. So we're going to put this empty string value at both A21I and A2 prime D. We do the same thing for A3. So H3, our follow was an H, so we're going to put A3H. So you're noticing there's going to be a problem. We're going to have this A3 going to empty string and A3 going to non-empty string, both at H. This is where some fudging comes in in the parsing to make sure it all works and once again is the source of a problem within uh, an error in my problem, an error in my solution, but I hope you're understanding the process. So then we look at A6 prime going to empty string and we look back at our follow table and we say A A6 prime part of its follow was M. So that means at A6 prime M we're gonna put this rule. The key I'm using here is A2 prime epsilon, sorry, A2 a2 prime epsilon, yeah, empty string. A3 epsilon, A10 prime epsilon. So instead of writing the full production rule, we're either going to write the production rule name, which means the option that doesn't go to empty string, or the production rule name empty string, which is the option that does go to empty string. And I'll show you the grid in a moment so you can understand why all these rules are important. So we do that for all the rest, A10 prime, empty string. We look at A10's, A10 primes follow, which is a E and an empty string. So we just follow, we fill in the E here. Um, the empty string is excessive because it's already going to an empty string. We take all these rules and then we create our predictive parser grid. You're not going to be able to see all of it. Um, so it's uh, all you do here is you go through your rules you've created and you fill in at each point. So at A1A, so on the left hand side are our variables A1, A2, a2 prime all the way down to A11 and on the top of our terminals A, B, C through star A, B, A, B through P and dollar sign and then at the cross points where we already found what we want to put there we fill in what production rule sits there so A1 goes at M A1 A um, A2 goes at A2 B so here A2 B A2 um, so all this is looking great until you get to this point, which is once again the problematic A3, where both this production rule and this production rule, A3 going to empty string and A3 going to... Um, so we decided not to go with this one, actually. We're using A3. We're using this version. So you'll see this production rule is exactly the same. This production rule... This production rule... H, A2I, A5, E, A3 is the same as this one, except the A3 is at the back. So I might as well just get rid of it now, because the one I used is putting A3 back here. It's, it's a bit of a problem, but H, A2, I, A5, E, A3. So what that means is we're getting a predictive parser where we're, there's two options, which is never good at this cross point. But the point is, we can continue to use our first 
um, not our first and follow, but we can use our uh, our constructing predictive parser steps two and three to fill in at the different cross points what production values should go at different places. And when you're done with this, I calculated there should be, I believe, 23 actual dots filled in. I starred all the positions that uh, result from the uh, that result from the step three. Um, I really hope you can see some of this stuff. I know it's a little bad, but um, if you're following along here, you should be able to see the process in uh, in in its as it as it is done. And I know this is a lot of writing, so it can be a little bit tedious. It took me quite a few hours to actually write it all out, and you have to be very attentive to detail. So now that you've finished your predictive parser table, it's time to go on to the actual parsing. So we've got the predictive parser. We have our part D. So in part D, Dr. Choi says apply uh, apply parser to the input string. Show all stack operations. So here's our initial input string. Program ID, left param, ID, comma. Like I said, this is very uh, very verbose. We want to get rid of this, make it easy, make it so that we don't we have fewer fewer areas to make errors, and there are already plenty. So we translate this into our new language of lowercase terminals A, B, C, B, G, B, D, E. So this is just this translated into these characters. This is J, I, J, E. Anytime you see a smudge is when I used whiteout. There were a few errors along the way. And then I finally write the whole thing out as a 32 character string. So this is the string we will be parsing. And I'll just say it here just so we're all clear on what it is. A, B, C, B, G, B, D, E, H, B, I, J, E, H, B, G, B, I, K, E, L, B, N, P, O, P, E, B, N, B, M, F. This is what our predictive parser needs to look at and say, is this an acceptable language or not? So, we begin. So, we start off with A1, this is our start symbol, and and dollar sign, and our full input string. And then we look at the predictive parser. This is when we need to have a couple papers in front of us. We need the predictive parser itself, we need the stack, and then we also need to know which production rules we're calling. So here's our production rule paper, here's our predictive parser, and the stack underneath it. So A1 is in the stack. It sees an input A. A1, A. We look at A1 and A in the predictive parser. Calls A1. The action, A1 goes to A, B, C, A2, D, E, A3, A4, F. Next we go back to the stack. Because this is, oh my goodness, because this is a stack, it goes in in opposite direction. So F replaces A1. The production role is a replacement of what was there previously. And now we read in Opposite direction, F, A4, A3, E, D, A2, C, B, A. The input. Now, A1 looks at the first element of the string, A. They match. Great. Take off the stack, take off the input. We've checked the first character. The first character is in the correct order. CB, same thing. CB, BC, BB, match. CC, match. Now we're at A2. Now, <clears throat> sorry, this was whited out here. This is supposed to be a B as well. very hard to see. That's a B. So A2, B, G, B. A2, we look at our predictive parser. Um, A2 goes to B, A2 prime. The action, A2 goes to B, A2 prime. Replace A2 with A2 prime B. Remember, flip the direction. Then we look again. B, B, they match. Remove B from the input, remove B from the stack. A2 prime looks at G. We look back at our predictive parser. A2 prime. A2 prime. G. Another A2 prime. We look at our production rule. A2 prime goes to G, B, A2 prime. 
our input, a2 prime, goes to g b a2 prime. We put it on the stack. a2 prime is replaced with a2 prime b g. g g they match. Take it off the input. Take it off the stack. b b they match. Take it off the input. Take it off the stack. a2 prime d. a2 prime. We look at d. a2 prime at d goes to our type three production rule, which is um, a2 prime going to empty string. So a2 prime going to empty string, that just means a2 prime gets pretty much removed. It's an empty string, and then we look at what's behind it, d. Excellent. d and d, they match. Take it off the input, take it off the stack. e <clears throat> and e, they match. Take it off the input, take it off the stack. a3, h, this is where the first bit of funny business comes in. So a3, we are going to choose the option of a3, which is the h a2, I, A5, E, A3 option, not the empty string option. That's the action. We stick it all back on the stack. So instead of A3 prime here, in opposite order, we're going to have an A3, E, A5, I, A2, H. H and H, H on the input, H on the stack, they match, take them off. A2 looks at B. B, A2, we're familiar with that, A2, B, A2 production rule, A2 production rule is B, A2 prime. Action, A2 goes to B, A2 prime. A2 prime, B. B, I, J. B and B, they match. Take it off the stack. A2 prime, I. A2 prime, I. A2 prime, I. Here is the A2 prime going to empty string option. So we put it here. A2 prime going to empty string. That means the A2 prime disappears. Now we're back at I. I and I, they match. Take them off the stack. A5, J. We look at A5 in our production rule. A5, go to J, A5 here, J, J is one of the options, J or K, we choose the J, A5 goes to J, replace A5 with J, now we have E, J, J and J, they match, take them off the stack, sorry I get a little sloppy here, I put two matches in the same column, E, E, they match, take it off, A3 prime, and H, so now we really don't want this to be A3 prime, we want this to be A3 so we're going to do A3 again with H to create the production rule. Sorry, A3, H, not the empty string production rule, but the H, A2, I, A5, E, A3 production rule. That's the action. We stick it all back on. A3, E, A5, I, A2, H. H, B, G, B, I. I just filled in some more of the full string. So I'm writing dot, dot, dot here and dot, dot, dot here because we could write out all the characters, but it's not really necessary. You really want to focus on where the action is happening between the two stack and input. So H and H, they match. A2, B, A2, B, familiar with that. A2, B, A2 goes to G, B, A2 prime. Um, sorry, A2 goes to B, A2 prime. So that's what I wrote here. B, A2, B, A2 prime. I, A2 prime, B, B, G, B matches, match. A2 prime, G, A2 prime, G, we look here. A2 prime, G on a particular parser, that's good. A2 prime, G, B, A2 prime. That's a production rule. A2 prime goes to G, B, A2 prime. As always, in reverse order, I, A2 prime, B, G, 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 match, off the stack. B, B, match, off the input, off the stack. A2 prime, I. <sighs> um, A2 prime, I is an empty string. So, A2 prime, I, Sorry, a2 prime goes to empty string, a2 prime goes away, now it's i, i and i, match off the stack, a5 and k, oh, finally a new production rule, a5, k, goes to a5, one of the options of a5 is k, we take that one, a5 goes to k, a5 replaced by k, k and k, they match, off the input, off the stack, e and e, they match, off the input, off the stack, a3, this is where another error comes in, this a3 really shouldn't exist, if we had the correct production, if we had the correct production rules, then this A3 would have probably been an empty string earlier, so it really should have disappeared. This is another error in my my proof. Sorry, my answer. These arrows indicate where the A3 messy is. The A3 funny business comes in, um, but if you overlook that, just get rid of it. It continues to work from there. So now A4 at L. All right, making progress. 
So A4, if we look here, A4, go across to L, A4, A4 goes to LA6M. So that means the action here is A4 goes to LA6M. So we put it on in reverse order. We're pretty close to the bottom now, but you're going to see we're going to build up the stack again. So it, it's really just F, M, A6, L. L, L match, take them off. A6, B. Now we look at A6, B. A6, B. We look here. A6, B calls A6. A6, we look here. A7, A6 prime. So that means A6 goes to A7, A6 prime. Put them on. F, M, A6 prime. A7, remember reverse order because it's the stack. A7, B. A7, B. We look at that. A7, B. Calls A7. Look at A7 production rule. A8 and A9. Therefore, A7 goes to A8 and A9. Put them on the stack. Now we're at F, M, A6 prime, A9, and A8. That was reverse order. A8, B. A8, B. Sorry. A8, B. Right here, A8. Take a look at production rule. I hope you can see that. Oh, man. There we go. That's bad. Okay. A8. A, uh, A8 here. B. A8 goes to B production rule. So we put it here. A8 goes to B. Stick it on the stack. So now we have A9 and B. B and B match. N and N match. A9 and P. We look at A9. Go all the way over to P. Also calls A9. A9 production rule is A10. So therefore A9 calls A10. We put A10 on. A10 and P. A10. A10 here goes all the way over to A10 here on P. We look at A10's production rule. A10 goes to A11, A10 prime. Put that on here as A, um, <clears throat> A10 goes to A11, A10 prime. Stick that on now. Now we have A10 prime, A11, A11 P, A11, luckily, sorry, I'm not using everything. A11 on the production rule on the predictive parser, on P, go all the way over, A11, here, P, A11, look at A11, A11 goes to B or P, we're going to pick P, A11, oh, where is it? A11 goes to P, stick P on, stack, P, P, the batch, take them off, A10 prime, A10 prime looks at O, sorry, A10 prime, O, look at O, A10 prime, O, A10 prime here on the cross, A10 prime, O, A11, A10, so A10 prime goes to O, A11, A10, stick them on, opposite order, A10 prime, A11, O, O and O match, on to the next page, A11, so this is all we still have on the stack, F, M, A6 prime, A10, 11, A10 prime, A11, A11 looks at P, a11, going over to P, A11, check the A11 production rule, also a P, pick the P option, stick a P on, P, P, match, A10 looks at E, A10, sorry, A10 looks at E, we look at our grid, A10 um, looks at, where the heck is it, um, oh, A10 prime, A10 prime, looks at A10 prime, empty string, so, a10 prime goes to empty string, get rid of A10. A6 prime, A6 prime looks at E. A6 prime, E, A6 prime, A6 prime, E, A7, A8. Um, A6 prime goes to E, A7, uh, A6 prime, opposite order, F, M. We already had the F and M. A6 prime, A7, E, E and E match. A7 and the B. A7, B goes to a7, A8, A9, A8, A8, and A9, A8, and A9, opposite order, A9, and A8, A8 with the B, goes to A8, B, A8, A8 goes to B, B, A8 goes to B, stick a B on and where A8 was, B and B match, take off the Bs on the input and stack, N and N match, take them off, B and A9. There's an error here. I don't know why it's at the very end. Some For some reason, this should have created um, an A9 here that would have gotten rid of this B. Um, it might have to do with something earlier with the threes. I'm not quite sure, but the F and the M are already correct for the final 
string. So once we get rid of this B, this M and this F for the end of the string will clear with this M and this F. I'm not sure what this error is. Another good question to ask Dr. Choi how to get around this last B. But for the end, you would just have this F and M, M and F matching, F and F matching. Dollar sign, dollar sign, the string's complete. The string is parsed and it passes. This is a valid element of the language. Thank you for listening. I know it's long. It'll take a really long time to write out. I'm sorry for my mistakes, but I hope this helped you understand. Thank you very much. Have a good night.